Thank you. As, as he said, I'm Abraham Clements. Uh, I've did this work in conjunction with Nave, Sarah Bagchi, and Matthias Payer. Uh, we are all uh, from Purdue University. I'm also with Sandia National Laboratories. And our work is ACES, Automatic Compartments for Embedded Systems. So let's start with the, the problem statement. First, we're targeting bare metal embedded systems. Uh, bare, metal and system, bare metal embedded systems operate without an operating system uh, with a single monolithic binary that's compiled, everything is compiled into one, uh, one binary. So here on the right I've depicted the, what an application looks like. You have some application logic on top of different libraries which perform different functionality. For example, here you've got a camera that have an image processing library, a hardware abstraction layer for the camera to abstract away the hardware. And similarly for TCP and Wi-Fi, wi you'd have a TCP stack, a Wi-Fi stack. Um, these systems, because of the way they operate, are vulnerable. They have lots of uh, interconnectivity. There's no isolation or privilege isolation in these systems. Uh, and Google's Project Zero demonstrated their vulnerability and the impact they can have with their uh, CVE 2017-6957. In this CVE, what they found is in a Wi-Fi system on a chip, they found some uh, memory corruption vulnerabilities that allowed them to compromise that chip. And then uh, just by having the Wi-Fi on, you didn't have to actually be connected to the access point, then they were able to take over the uh, application processor and cell phones. And so ACES here applies to legacy code. We're looking at uh, these systems are used in IoT devices, vehicles, lots of embedded systems will use these small microcontrollers that are now connected, and they're vulnerable. They, don't, they often don't apply any defenses, even uh, data execution prevention, which has been quite standard for probably two decades now, is not applied, and there's no separation of privileges. The result is a single vulnerability can compromise the entire system. So ACE's goal is to create many compartments within these applications. Uh, this applies the principle of least privileges, and it creates, we create sub-thread level compartments, and we protect the integrity of sensitive data and peripherals. So we're integrity only. We don't protect confidentiality. Uh, to do this, we use static analysis of the program to infer compartments and then allow a policy to determine how those compartments should be formed. This separates compartmentalization from the application development so that the developer can experiment with different policies based on their application needs. And so on the right, I've kind of depicted what the application would look like after compartments are applied. You have application logic separated from each of the libraries, and each of the libraries would then have uh, data associated with them and hardware peripherals. These systems use memory map peripherals. And so by we can isolate the which peripherals code can access. So some related work on embedded system and bare metal embedded system in particular security is there's our work, Epoxy, which was in Oakland 2017, where we applied uh, data execution prevention, diversity, and stack protections to bare metal systems. However, it did not address least privileges. Uh, embed Microvisor is a software suite, is a runtime and API by ARM for their Cortex M microcontrollers that enables you to manually create compartments within their applications. Uh, however, their compartments intermix this, the application logic with the compartments and requires the use of their operating system. Minion also creates compartments within these bare metal systems. Uh, they do it at a thread level, and they use a fixed algorithm to determine how compartments are formed. So first, let's talk about a little more formally what a compartment is. So a compartment's a set of concurrently accessible memory regions and authorized control flows before, between them. So we're, in our compartments, we'll restrict access to memory and control flows between compartments. So here I've depicted uh, a small part of a program with some each four functions, on button, take image, TX image, and TCP uh, TX, with con uh, control flow or calls between those functions. So if we put them into compartments, so you have compartment A and compartment B, we'll then restrict the control flow, so the only control flow between the compartments that's allowed is the yellow or the orange edge now. Then we'll also place restrictions on the memory that those compartments can access. So here in the middle of this uh, image in yellow, there's peripherals that are memory maps. There's Wi-Fi, camera, GPIO, and a UART. And then down in the RAM, there's global data, it's region one and region two. And then the compartments that hold the code are 
down in the green. Off to the right, they've got compartment A and B with the uh, gray box indicating the permissions that have, which compartments have access to which region of memory. So we create the compartments using static analysis. So first, our first step is we analyze the program to identify uh, code, data, and peripheral dependencies. So ACES um, ensures that every, that code can access all its required data and peripherals that are identified during this analysis. And then we use, a, because of the aliasing analysis problem, we also use a microemulator to dynamically identify missed uh, dependencies due to aliasing. Our compartments are code-centric, which means that code belongs to one compartment. Um, and our policies are used to determine how functions, global variables, and peripherals should be grouped together to create a compartment. They can be flexible, uh, and the idea is that they'd be much like a compiler option that you'd select while compiling the application to apply different policies. We've implemented three policies that I'll explain a little bit uh, later, but they're naive file name, optimized file name, and peripheral-based policies. And then we use a memory protection unit, which is similar to an MP MMU, uh, except it only enforces read, write, and execute permissions on physical memory. Uh, they generally have uh, eight, to six, 8 to 16 regions that they can enforce memory on and apply different permissions. Uh, because we use the MPU, we have to satisfy all of its constraints. And there's alignment and size constraints on regions. So the first step that ACES takes is to generate a program dependency graph. So on the left here, I've depicted an example of a, a smart doorbell. When you press the button, it'd take a picture. It's kind of representative code. The details of it aren't terribly important. Uh, but on the right is a program dependency graph, which would come from this program. And so we show again those same functions with their control flow. And then uh, there's dependencies on the peripherals and global variables. You'll notice that there's some interdependency between the functions and their global data and camera, the peripherals. So the peripherals, again, are depicted in yellow and the global data in blue. So the first step is we convert this to a region graph. So we're going to first identify the memory dependencies and solve the memory dependencies, and then we'll apply the control flow restrictions. So the program dependency graph is mapped to a region graph. The first thing we do is to take the functions and convert them to regions. Every function goes into its own region initially, and control flow edges are not transferred at this state. The global data is also mapped one global variable to one region, and then peripherals are mapped one to many. There's one region created for every dependency in the program dependency graph. This is because the peripherals are dependent on their hardware. Their addresses are fixed in hardware, and so each code region can determine how it accesses those peripherals independently of all the other code regions, whereas global data, all code regions have to agree on how they'll access uh, global data. So after forming the region graph, We'll generate a, we'll apply a compartmentalization policy. Um, so this defines which which compart which code function and peripheral should be grouped together. So the policy creates those initial groupings. So we implemented a naive file name policy, which groups them together based off the file name they're defined in. An optimized file name, which starts with the naive file name policy, and moves all uh, functions and global data to the compartment or to the region that they have the most connectivity to. And then the peripheral-based policy identifies functions which use peripherals and walks up the control flow graph, adding functions until there's a conflict in permissions. And then any, any functions which have dependency on more than one set of peripherals are added to a single compartment. So after, uh, in this example on the right, I'm going to just show uh, a kind of a contrived policy that shows some of the edge cases that occur while applying compartments. So first, we're going to merge the TX image and TCP TX, and then we'll merge the global button and global image. So these will now be laid out in memory in the same locations or together. Uh, after applying the policy, we'll optimize, we can apply optimizations that should improve security or improve performance. Really, an optimization just transforms the region graph from one region graph to another region graph while preserving dependencies. So here in this example, you'll notice that uh, take image and on button have the same set of dependencies. So we merge them into the same code region. After that, we lower it, or we meet the hardware constraints. Uh, so this reduces the graph to meet those hardware constraints. In this example, we can only have 
four, compart four MPU regions. So we have to lower the number of dependencies for each code region to be less than the number of available MPU regions. So we iteratively will merge until we meet that requirements with using a cost function to determine what the lowest cost merge is at each state. Uh, lowering does increase the permissions. So as you merge things together, then additional code regions will obtain uh, permissions to additional global variables and peripherals. And merging functions or merging peripherals may add actually additional peripherals. So in the example, we've got the, we merged the global TX and global state. That doesn't increase any permissions. And then to lower, we need to now merge another region. So we'll merge the Wi-Fi and GPIO, but because they're physically located in memory and we have to have one region that covers them, that, that also picks up the UART and camera. So after lowering the graph, we'll map that to memory. So the code regions on the left become the foundations for compartments A and compartment B, and then everything is mapped to memory as shown on the right. And that, again, that this, this uh, if you'll notice there, B, because we needed to merge the Wi-Fi and the GPIO, we have to have a power of two in the MPU configuration, so we also picked up the UART and camera. Uh, we, then after applying the memory regions, de determining the memory regions, we instrument calls and returns crossing compartment boundaries. So I've depicted the control flow of the program again on the right. We'll instrument every call that crosses compartment boundaries to invoke a compartment switcher and the returns of any destination of a call across compartment boundaries to also invoke the compartment switcher. The compartment switcher uses metadata that we embed in the program to authenticate the calls and transitions to make sure that they're authorized in both directions. Then we use a micro emulator, which emulates in software all the effects of the store instructions. This overcomes two limitations, limitation of static analysis that allows us to provide do dynamic profiling of the application to determine accesses that weren't identified during our static analysis. And it also allows access to sub uh, MPU regions or memory regions smaller than that are allowed by the MPU. To do this, we dynamically profile a benign execution of the program. We generate a whitelist and then encode that whitelist into read-only data. And then during execution, when a fault occurs, the microemulator checks to see if the fault occurred on an address that's authorized. And if it is, then it will... If perform the effects of the write and return to execution. We also use the microemulator to provide protections of the stack, which I've depicted here on the right. The, every time there's a compartment transition, the previous portion of the stack is made read-only using a memory protection units. And then new lo this allows the, new, the compartment to add new locals to the stack with read-write permissions, but if it needs to access any prior part of the stack or needs to write any prior part of the stack, the microemulator would be used to enable those writes and a whitelist also used. We then evaluated our application on, our evaluated ACES using the three policies which I described previously on, on five applications on a Cortex-M4 development board. The first application we used was Pinlock. Pinlock is an Example of a smart lock, which we wrote, it takes a pin over a serial port, and if that pin is correct, it hashes the pin, and if the, hit, the hash matches a saved pin, then we uh, turn on an LED signifying that a lock would be unlocked. The other applications, FATFS, microSD, TCP echo, LCD, microSD, and animation are all example applications that were provided with the de development board we used for evaluation. To understand better how ACES affects the security of applications, we examined a case study where on Pinlock where an attacker wants to unlock the lock uh, using a right what where memory vulnerability. And we this function we say is in the how UART receive IT function, which is the function which is responsible for receiving data from the UART. There's four ways that the attacker could unlock the lock on this application. The first two are overwrites. So you could overwrite the stored pin in global the global variable. You could over directly write the GPIO pin to unlock the lock. And you could also perform control flow hijacks. First is a direct control flow hijack where they call the unlock directly call the unlock function. The other is where they deputize another function 
which calls the control flow or cause calls the unlock function to uh, call the unlock function by providing it the appropriate inputs to make it call the unlock function. Notice that the naive file name and optimized file name policy protect against all four, but the peripheral policy only protects against GPIO attack. This is because the GP, the global variable containing the pin, the unlock function, and functions which call the unlock function are all in the same compartment as the how you are receive function. We then evaluate the runtime of ACEs and find that it can have moderate impact. It can also have very high impact depending on the policy. So in the graph, the, the axis is the or number of times overhead. So we can have 13 to 25% overhead for peripheral policy, uh, and then up to 5 and 5.7 overhead. The emulating of instructions causes the largest amount of the increase. The graph depicts in the brown the amount of time spent emulating instructions. The blue is time entering compartments, and red is or exiting compartments. And the blue, red is entering compartments. Blue is exiting compartments. The emulation replaces a single, is the largest source of our overhead. And this is because it replaces a single instruction with hundreds of instructions and a interrupt call. We then evaluate the memory overhead. And memory overhead is broken into two parts, the changes to the flash, which is read-only data, and changes to the RAM. In the RAM, or in flash, we add uh, the, we have fragmentation, which is caused by meeting the requirements. This is the red color. Fragmentation is met by, is caused by meeting the requirements of the MPU, which require that all regions be a power of two in size, and it accounts for the largest part of our overhead. We also make changes to the code when we instrument the code, which is shown in blue. The runtime, we add our runtime, which is the compartment switcher and emulator, which is the tan color. And then we add metadata for encoding transitions and whitelists, which is the gray. In the RAM, again, the largest Im impact is caused by fragmentation. And we add a small runtime amount of runtime memory to save the uh, compartment stack and microemulators stack. The next generation of MPUs, which are, uh, with the time of developing this had not been, there were no parts that had it, but the architecture has been released do not have a power of two re alignment requirements, which would remove the fragmentation overhead. In conclusion, ACES applies least privileges to IoT devices, uh, does not require changes to the application logic, and uses existing hardware. ACES automatically creates and enforces sub-thread level, level compartments. This decouples the security policy from application development. It frees the developer from having to manage the hardware constraints of the security hardware, and then enables research in creating, compartment, creating compartmentalization policies. Our goal was to provide the mechanisms to enable compartments to be formed, and we evaluated a few policies, though there are many, many more possible. And our, code will be in that, our code will be available at uh, GitHub as soon as it's through review at Sandia. Uh, I'll now take any questions. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, please come. Yeah. Yeah. It runs. So during the development process, it's run in a whitelist in a uh, in a, uh, a record mode. So it records accesses, and then during the actual app execution, it runs in an enforced mode where it checks the whitelist. So it runs during that deployment. OK, thank you. All right, so I, I have a question or more of a clarification for you. Uh, I saw that one of the uh, assumptions that you made is that code can only belong to one compartment, right? So then how do you deal with, uh, say, shared functions or, or library functions? Okay. Yes, so uh, there is one, uh, the program, like standard libraries and pre-compiled libraries are put into a default region, and that default, those then execute with the permissions of the compartment that calls them. 
So for example, memcopy, if it's used in multiple functions or multiple, from multiple compartments, every time it runs, it would run with the permissions of the compartment from which it was called. Uh, all right, let's thank the speaker one more time.